Dr. Lori Zoloff. She's a Margaret E. Burton Professor of Religion and Ethics and a Senior Advisor to the Provo Provost for Programs on Social Ethics here at the University of Chicago. Professor Zoloff's interests focus on the intersection of bioethics and religion, particularly Jewish studies. Um, she's a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Her work on bioethics and healthcare led her to serve on the NASA Advisory Council and the Space, uh, the Space Agency's highest civilian advisory board and the International Planetary Protection Committee. Today, Professor Zoloff will give a talk entitled Global Warming, Healthcare, and Chicago History. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Lori Zoloff. Oh, this one's the way. I do research on, on genetically modified um, organisms, and so the Golden Rice was the beginning of the most active and successful anti-GMO campaign based on almost no evidence. It was, they, they mounted a campaign and they destroyed an intervention that could have saved um, millions of children in the world from blindness. So there you go. It was the first of that wave of anti-GMO thing. It, it's seen as an inc incredible tragedy by people who are um, using genetic technology to modify foods for the benefit of the poor, because it set it back two decades. So, but no, no adverse effects or SAEs at all in that trial. It was all about the consent. Right. Okay, back on to global warming. So. I want to talk about the deadliest week in the city of Chicago, and I want to say at the outset of this talk that I am a Californian, which will become important as this goes on, right? And as we go forward, we're not going forward, this way. One block from where we're sitting today, July 1995, was the worst catastrophe in terms of heat waves, in terms of climate change, as yet in the United States. How many of you know this? The Chicagoans, but significant numbers don't. And I want to say I was off in California at the time. Okay, I had a one-year-old baby, last of my five children, but still, this did not make any national news. And when I teach this to children, to my children, to my, to my students, um, who are in fact children, um, they have no record. It's meaningless to them. They have no memory of this. There's no institutional memory of this. When you ask them of the worst cases of climate change deaths, this just doesn't register whatsoever. Now, climate change is a serious public health issue. I'm going to try to convince you it's also a serious ethical issue in this talk. Obviously, rising sea levels threaten coastal communities, um, New York, Mumbai, Shanghai, London, Los Angeles, my hometown. Increasing drought has led to horrible fires in the West, we've just seen. Increasing storm activity threatens many parts of the country, but it's heat waves that can be the most fatal. And if you're feeling smug about California right now, like it looks so nice to live there, but oh, that's such a disaster area, um, don't, because the worst climate catastrophes have often been not hurricanes or fires, but heat wave because of urban density, of course. And the worst one in U.S. history took place right here. Now, in 1995, in three days in Chicago, 739 people are thought to have died. Now, how to consider this, how to think about this relatively, is that um, the current occurrence is 1,500 heat-related deaths a year. This was in three days, half of the, the mort morbidity mortality in a year. Or the campfire in California, the fire last year, which is considered the worst wildfire death, was only 86 people. Terrible for those 86 people, but nowhere near the death rate of the Chicago incident. Now, this is the, the, um, how, how it went. Here's your statistics serial analysis. You can see the great jump in July. And who died? Well, it was bad to be a poor, black, elderly man in Chicago that week. Most of the apartments in the area were not air-conditioned, and if they were, the units were often broken, they were too expensive to run, there were not units in public housing, by and large. The brick buildings that surround the University of Chicago and most of South Chicago are built to contain heat because they're built for the winter months. Chicago is built to keep you warm. Right? Not to keep you cool. Um, the way people thought about hot summers was, hmm, it's like, it, yeah, it was summer, it was hot, it, was, it wasn't a catastrophe. And, but most people died, even though the entire city was equally hot, in just a few south and west side neighborhoods. And the issue becomes why, and that's where it becomes an ethical issue. In, this is the, the heat death map, and you can see just a few neighborhoods were affected in a citywide event. Now, social economic factors, of course, determine the way that mortality and morbidity were structured. The most important factor was if people loved you, if people were near you, if people checked on you. If you were isolated and you've had little social connection, you were at much more higher risk. 
Now, people stayed in their houses, and oftentimes um, people came to rescue them, found that the doors were barred or the windows were barred, because they were afraid of crime. So younger people could go into the parks and off to the lake, but older people disproportionately feared the crime. Um, an anomalous fact that many people have noticed and written about, very few deaths took place in the Hispanic neighborhoods with identical geographic demo and, and demographic and housing stock things. So something different happened in these tight-knit Hispanic communities where people did check on their elderly relatives. Here they are sleeping in the park, and not just any old park, but of course that's the midway right outside there. You'll see it's almost all men and younger men. The city morgue actually ran out of space and had to put the bodies on the sidewalk outside of the morgue. Um, nighttime temperature effect, we're familiar with this because we just, this, this summer was a very hot one as well. We, we, people couldn't cool down. The critical temperature stayed in the, in the upper 90s throughout these three days. But the city had no plan. The city had no plan to alert people. It had no plan to check on anyone. It didn't have cooling centers. And in fact, the weather forecaster, the sainted Tom Skilling, told people that this was coming and he was largely ignored. The mayor, of course, was out of town. Now, the heat toll death fought was to hold 300. It was tw more than twice as much as this. And they ran out of spaces to bury people. To the state, there ended up being about 45 bodies who were never claimed. So I said that they were buried in a mass grave in Chicago. Now, here's what the future looks like. Much hotter, much denser heat waves, much more urbanization. So all these effects, of course, are increasing. Heat waves are both only the most dramatic effect of global warming. There's pressure on food crops, and of course we can't use golden rice anymore or modified food, so, you know. And, um, this, this was a very wet year in the state of Illinois, this, in the Midwest. There was enormous floods, and um, so the, there was a, there's gonna be a, a pressure on food crops we're gonna see in the, in the, coming, in the coming season. Um, if there's fire, as it is in California, it raises prices on agricultural goods, mostly affected in wine, but it can happen in other places. The increase in particulates because of increasing dust and fire residue. My whole family has their little masks fitted for them. Um, the children have little printed masks with little um, smiley faces on them, but they're wearing them because of the increased particulates in the Bay Area and in Southern California. Increasing the asthma, increasing the respiratory rate, increasing cardiac stress. Um, mental health issues, of course, exacerbated as temperatures increase. Fierce storms mean more homelessness and loss of place. There's a worldwide care to this problem. Now we see dramatic shifts in populations. Much of the pressure on the southern border of the United States is because of an earlier massive drought in the Guatemalan highlands. That unprecedented drought forced millions of people out of their farms into cities and, of course, walking north. There's increases in emergency room visits, in chronic conditions. Of course, it, it, metabolic disease is affected by heat, cardiovascular disease is affected by heat, workplace risk for outside workers, increases for construction, and any outdoor trade. But the thing that I'm interested in um, is vector-borne diseases, infectious and vector-borne diseases. Where's my ID person over there? As you know, the range of everything is changing. Dengue fever is now the fastest growing disease worldwide, and it's nearly um, impossible to eradicate the dengue. These, uh, the, the mosquitoes are very clever. They can overwinter. The Zika, of course, um, spread highlights our vulnerabilities. Chikungunya also spreading. Tick-borne disease increasing dramatically. Uh, just um, Powassan disease just killed um, um, Kay Hagan, Democratic from North Carolina, a wonderful liberal progressive voice, just was bitten by a tick apparently on a hiking trip and died of this Powassan disease, increasing in numbers every year. In tick-borne encephalitis, of course, Lyme disease we know, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And I'm particularly interested in malaria because as you know from last year's talk, um, malaria was a very important disease in the United States and the efforts to combat it have stalled. There are no effective countermeasures to the malaria burden right now. Um, mosquitoes have outwitted human beings once again, and we're faced with the possibility of a, a widely spreading malaria outbreak. It's a serious and sometimes fatal parasitic infection in 100 countries worldwide, and it's been the same 100 countries. Um, the coma and death that can occur, it's not a mild disease at all. It disproportionately affects people, particularly children, in the lowest and poorest countries of the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and South America. And about between 400 and 500,000 deaths a year, which is about a child every two minutes. So we can count up how many children will die during this very talk, for instance. Um, 
1870, this was the malaria map, it was the most important disease in the United States, the leading cause of death in the US. You can see it now, look closely at Chicago on that map. This was a terribly malarial area, a swampy malarial area. Um, and in fact, the entire Mississippi Valley was, was, a, a, was a wonderful place to stay if you were a malaria mosquito. How did this um, falciparum malaria got there because of the slave trade, of course. Malaria began to retreat over time because agricultural practices changed and because people moved out of malarial areas, but not out of the American South, so it was very persistent in the southern states. The death rates fell dramatically just because this, is, this was before um, DDT was invented. It was just using quinine and drainage of swamps and education campaigns. Um, this is WPA. Roosevelt sent workers into the South to begin clearing swamps, and of course the Tennessee Valley Authority controversially drained some areas, flooded some others, and if you're like pop culture, like me, you know the Orzark has a whole subplot about the Tennessee Valley Authority submerging farmers, um, but they did get rid of the malaria in the South. But it was not eradicated until 1951, until DDT became widely available and was used in aerial, aerial spraying and aerial crop spraying in 1951. I was already born, what can I say? So. Now why is this an ethical question? Sad, tragic story of Chicago, scary ideas about malaria and vector spreading, but why ethical? And this is because it's driven by climate change, and climate change is an ethical problem because it is due to the release of certain carbon and methane in the atmosphere, which of course you know. But it's also true, it's potentiated by our very participation in a global economy that needs our enthusiastic participation to continue. Because of our country's decisions about budgets, about how much is spent, about legislation, about healthcare spending, about inspections, research, etc. cetera. Um, I have a, a brother-in-law who works as, on the docks in, um, in first the Bay Area and then in Los Angeles, and he said the dock workers that inspect for falciparum mosquitoes, which used to be done on a regular basis, have all been cut by the current administration, and now one ship a year is checked for invasive mosquitoes. Yeah. Now, this is a well-characterized and data-driven uh, science reality. Since 1870, we know about the greenhouse effect. The most profligate users of carbon are Americans per capita, and especially the wealthiest Americans, and the populations most at risk are the people that have contributed at least to the disease. That is the heart of the ethical problem of climate change, which we all know. But the, the, the second part is this, that we do know, but we still don't act. And the longer we don't act to radically change our lives, it continues in a deepening of, in, of unjust relationships. This lack of response to the plight of the poor is linked to, this more, um, to, to the mortality of climate change. The ethical issue of climate change is thus a public health problem, not only a social justice problem, but a public health problem, a problem for physicians in particular. And Second to last person on the, on the thing, I want to say a little something about classic philosophy. I teach Emmanuel Levinas here at the University of Chicago. And for Levinas, when the stranger approaches you, when the stranger known to you approaches you, the poorest of the poor in Chicago, the most isolated of the poor in Chicago, the poorest of the poor of our planet who live in sub-Saharan Africa, when they come to you and you're aware of their face, that moment of the approach of the stranger is the ethical moment par excellence in Levinas's French, um, understanding that your moral agency, your capacity to act as a moral agent beyond the four principles is encountered at that moment, is formed at that moment, and in fact it's an ontic moment as well, for yourself comes into being in a substantially different way when you are the one who, in Levinas's terms, have to come up with the goods, when you are taken hostage by the stranger, when you are the first on the scene for the stranger, and I would argue for physicians in particular, being the first on the scene has a, is a resonant call to you, and should be. And this is true for Emmanuel Levinas, even if you feel yourself to be innocent, the gaze of the stranger should remind you that you are not innocent. And here, of course, we're not at all innocent. We're very culpable in this problem, and, and we know it. We don't even need this existential guilt um, to, to motivate us. We have actual real-time real guilt. 
Um, global warming is happening. It's as long predicted. The only changes in predictions are that everything is much, much worse than we thought. It's unclear what's happening to the lake. 50% of NOAA scientists who work on the lake say it's going to keep getting, now it's 11 inches above, its ever, above the, um, the highest point it's ever been. Maybe it'll keep going up. The other half say it'll dry up, so it's unclear what's happening to our very own lake. But the only thing that's, that's changed is that things are worse and they're happening faster. Now, local and regional and national changes, we still, can mitigate some effects, but the practice of ethics should include paying attention to this scientific reality, I would argue, before anything else, before anything else. Um, Chicagoans in particular have a responsibility to need to remember our most recent history. After the disaster in 1995, Daley did act. And his administration released an adorable report. It had a city disaster plan with a snowstorm on the cover, just to obfuscate the issue. Um, a plan is now in place, in fact, to check on people. Um, cooling stations are advertised widely. We all see the signs. In, in, there are many media outlets. Everyone knows you can go to a cooling center, and the police are, out, are, are supposed to knock on doors and get people out. And of course, the weatherman, especially Tom Skilling, um, no, yes, brother of that other one, um, is read in Chicago as canonical text, and you always need to trust Tom Skilling. So I want to say thank you. Um, target malaria has taught me a lot about the spread of malaria and the spread of dengue. WHO is working hard on this, but the mosquitoes, as I said, are winning and are, and are exactly coming north as their range is spreading. Um, the Anopheles mosquitoes are still here. They didn't disappear, just the parasite did. So they're ready, as they were in 1776. Um, the University of Chicago Divinity School, who gave me a whole year to think about this, and the University of Cambridge, Clare Hall, and the Boucher Foundation, who allowed me to come there and read lots of books to think about climate change and to think about our obligations and responsibilities. And of course, Mark, you've given so much to all of us and to me as well. And I just want to thank you. You've just been terrific. A leader in our field, uh, a leader in our discipline, and a leader at the University of Chicago. So thank you very much. And thank you, of course, always to my students. Thank you. And questions? An agreeing audience. It's okay. <laughs> It was a sobering talk, but also inspiring. Okay. <laughs> One is you have to act like scientists. And if you're not a scientist like me, you have to act like you believe scientists, right? Which we, we do in, in many other arenas, but then our behavior is in consonant with our belief systems. So really, really understanding it means you cannot eat meat anymore. <laughs> you really can't drive a car very much anymore. And you should really limit how much you fly. Right, so um, I was also president of the American Academy of Religion, and I proposed that the AAR, which is 10,000 members, radically change its behaviors and act like climate change is real and take a sabbatical year every seven years. Big idea, spectacular failure. No one wanted to give up their, the least little bit of their, of their meeting time. So that's one thing. In every institution, in every organization say, here are the things we know that reduces carbon burden. It's eating meat, it's transportation, it's how we heat our, our institutions. There's things we know, you know, plastic water bottles. I mean, we know exactly how much everything costs us in terms of carbon, figure it out. And in your institution, in your office, in your school, act as if you believe it, as if you care about science. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is we have to, this is an election year, need I say more, right? We have to get our country back into the Paris a Climate Accord. It's, it, it's the only hope for a reduction to 2%, um, to, to 2 degrees, and it's a failing hope as it is, but we have to act both locally at city level, Chicago is, is as by itself signed the accord, like many mayors, but we have to really think politically why it's so important this year to express our concern about this issue, insist that this issue be debated and discussed. And also, we have to look at our personal practices. Everything you do is a moral gesture. Everything is a moral gesture. And you have to act like you, like now, it's very tempting to act like I work for BP, right? To get on the plane and, you know, and act as if I, I should burn as much carbon as I possibly can. But we have to really think about it. How we live in our homes, what we, how we feed our families, what we share with our students. I actually recommended that you tithe 10% of your time to think about climate change. So in every class you teach, 
right? One week in a quarter system can be about climate change and why it's important. Not that your entire life is taken over by it, because God knows if we don't do anything, it will, but like in California. Um, but to give some percentage of your time and your energy and your, and your brilliant attention to the catastrophe that really does await us as if we walk forward not doing anything, if we, if we do do that, if we just walk forward like it doesn't matter, it is, gonna, um, it is gonna be the kind of catastrophe we see all the time. You know, as a Californian, I, you know, my, my 99 year old mother has been evacuated twice already, right? And these, this, this fragility is, is, um, is really going to concern all of us. We are fragile in a way that we've never thought about before. And the 1995 heat wave is just the smallest of indicators with a terrible death rate um, that should alert us to how important this is and how we should stop thinking it's not gonna happen. It's happening, it's happening now. So that's, those are my three ideas. Thank you.